This, this is the ABQ Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. Each week, we'll interview visionary business leaders to inspire the creative, powering spirit that's in every entrepreneur. Discussing strengths, weaknesses, strategies, systems, and the problems we can all solve together for a new future for local small business. Hi, this is the Albuquerque Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. I've got a super special guest today. I'm really excited. We have a best-selling author, and I know we're going through the whole COVID-19 and everything that's going on, but sales, closing, having that ability to be able to communicate with someone properly, I think is probably one of the most essential things, especially now with what's going on. We have James Muir. He is the founder and CEO of Best Practices International. He's a best-selling author, the number one book on closing sales, and I encourage everyone to go on Amazon right now and purchase it. It's called The Perfect Close. James is a 30-year veteran of sales, having served in every role, from an individual contributor to an ex- executive VP, and his mission, and I love this, James, and I want you to, if you can't elaborate on this, is to make the complex simple. <laughs> yes, that's the that's the mission is <laughs> just to make the complex. So, and the thing is, I think a lot of times we just overthink stuff. And so, uh, why, you know, and, and when you step back and you look at it at, you know, 30,000 feet, you realize it's not nearly as complicated as you, you think it is. I think a lot of times people get into these situations where they have to sell. Sometimes it's because they're entrepreneurs and sometimes they're dedicated to selling, but, um, and the, it's the pressure just causes them to think too hard about it, but it's really not that complicated. So uh, like to get in the beginning, because I know we have a lot of small business owners listening and entrepreneurs and we, we have sales director sales. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, managers and stuff like that, general managers. What, what, what do you view? Like, what is your view on sales? So, uh, in a nutshell, I, I say selling is serving. And what you'll find is that, uh, if you've got, let's say you've got someone on your team, who's got some sales reluctance, it usually boils down to two things, skill and will. And believe it or not, these two are also kind of connected to each other. When we say skill, it would be like, oh, they don't know how to ask for clothes or they don't know how to sell. And will would be they don't have the desire, right? There's something about their willpower to do it. And usually when you – and between those two, by the way, that willpower is definitely the bigger challenge. The right. two is far more, far more common. I mean, if, you, if someone has a challenge and it's just that they don't know how, well, we can fix that. We can just train them, right? And we're good to go. But uh, on the willpower side, when you start to peel back the onion and figure out what it really is, usually – there's something inside of them that says, oh, selling is wrong. It's about manipulation or it's about persuading people or something. And so they feel like they're doing something to a person when they sell rather than helping them. Mm. And, and if you get to the root of that uh, erroneous belief, actually, and that selling is actually serving, then uh, and you can flip that paradigm. It, basically, in the same way you would want to help a person in a wheelchair get across the street or onto an airplane or something like that you'll start to see selling exactly the same way. You're just trying to help someone achieve a result. And that paradigm shift removes all the reluctance. In fact, once they they really embrace it, it actually is inherently motivating, right? You want to go out and help another person, right? Because you've seen the results that you're able to produce for folks. So uh, it, it takes usually more than the 15 seconds that it just took me to explain that to you to shift someone's paradigm. But basically that's when you do that, you end up removing all that reluctance that we see. Yeah. And I, and I think, uh, and you know, some, one of the things that you push is, you know, sales doesn't have to have this, uh, you know, like the always be closing and we'll get into that. Cause you, you have that in your book under myth too, but it's, it's kind of one of these things where people think that they have to be like, not provide information, kind of be a little shady, you know, um, what, what, what is the, what is that like old school selling compared to like this new paradigm that you talk about in your book? Well, here's, here's the thing is the old world of selling where, uh, I mean, I guess we zoom back in history and figure out why is it that sales has this reputation like this? And, uh, and that's because in the past, salespeople had most of the information when it came to a product or a service and the, and the buyer didn't have that information. And so that let the salespeople, if the person, if they were unscrupulous, they could take, possibly take advantage of the buyer. Right. Okay. And sometimes they did. And so we, we have this, you know, the saying, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware, right? Watch mm-hmm. out. Someone might take advantage of you, right? But here's the thing. That world doesn't exist at all anymore. Like, um, because of the internet, I mean, it's, it's super common that the buyers know more about the product or the service than the seller does. Yes, yeah, so That happens. Course, yeah. Like, yeah, like last time you bought a car, 
did you actually go on the lot and just start wandering around looking at cars? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, we we I did all the research online. Yeah, exactly. That's what everyone does, and you can find almost if, all the way down to if it's ever been in an accident or anything. You can find everything you could possibly want to know about the car before you ever walk onto the lot. So yes. this this old school world where the the buyer had all the information and that gave him an advantage over the seller. That just doesn't exist anymore. And, and truthfully, for the most part, like in the 99 percentile range, nobody sells like that. People don't sell like that anymore, but that stigma still floats around. Like if you, if you survey people and say, Hey, when, what, are, what are the words you think of when you hear the word sales, you'll get a four to one ratio of negative terms mm -hmm. for every positive. Right. I and mean, you get like sleazy and slimy and, you know, it sounds like the lost, you know, seven dwarfs of selling, but, um, those are the kind of adjectives that you give it. So that's one of the reasons that people hesitate or they are reluctant when they sell is because they don't want to be thrown into that same bucket as this old school selling. They don't want to be that person. And so they, they won't do any manipulative stuff, which is good, but most of the things being taught out there, especially when it comes to closing, they are manipulative. <laughs> and, and so what happens is they, uh, what comes time to ask for a commitment, since they can't think of a way of doing that without being a manipulative and damaging the relationship, they just don't do anything. Yeah. And I and, think um, a, a car, I think a car dealership is perfect. I have several clients on my digital marketing side and it's, it's amazing the message they're putting out there online. And then by the time what is actually happening when you get into the dealership. Absolutely. It's, it's really evolved uh, that whole industry completely. Um, so that, I, I mean, the, the idea, again, that a seller is going to take advantage of the buyer really is long gone. Right. Um, but the, the reputation still, I mean, there's a, there's a report called, that comes out every year. It's called the Edelman Report. It's the Edelman Trust Barometer is what it's called. And they analyze countries and cities and all this stuff for trust. Right. And uh, careers is one of the things that they evaluate. And the second to the lowest career for trust is selling. There's only one. Uh, less than that, and that's politicians. <laughs> so, even lawyers are higher than salespeople oh, on, the, on the Edelman Trust Barometer. So um, anyway, I, I think that's the reputation that really key, holds back a lot of salespeople. They don't want to fall into it. They don't want to be one of those kind of people, but they're not exactly sure how to navigate the whole process without slipping into that. And when they go out to find training out there, if you just, you know, if you go onto YouTube and just Google, you know, how to close sales, you're going to get some seriously bad advice right. on there. I mean, most of the stuff that comes out is just really, really awful. And the iron ironic part of all that is that the studies have been done and it, most of those have been proven to be very, very erroneously. <laughs> I mean, they actually create negative results. They don't actually help you close. They actually do the opposite. They backfire on you. So how they keep persisting is just beyond me. Yeah. And, and it, you know, and it's amazing because I can go into and you can see the culture of I've gone into these, you know, certain car dealerships and it's still, you know, even though that message online may be, you know, easy, transparent, all that. When you walk into there, it's still the, you know, salesperson being pressured by the sales manager. It's still, you know, keep them here for hours, hold their keys back, you know, and then you've got to close them this second right now. Um, you know, it, it, would I do this if you would do this? Would you buy right now if, you know, if I can do this? And there's this whole process. And, and I want to get into that with you. Uh, but there's this whole process of this negotiation and like an us mm -hmm. versus them. How do we, how do you bridge that gap? Like if, if you were consulting with the company, what would you say if, if your message online is different than the culture that's in the business and you're seeing these sales managers, sales directors, uh, and salespeople, you know, interacting in like a really old school way? Well, so is that directed at the buyer or the seller there? Who do you want me to give coaching to? Uh, to the, uh, like, let's say we'll, we use, we'll stick with the dealership. So let's say the dealership, like the, they're still doing the old school methods of selling. What what would you say to, because I, I had somebody call me the other day and they were talking to me about this. Um, they were doing insurance, you know, and so insurance is a big field and and they were discussing, you know, like, how do I do this with annuities and the high percentage, you know, and, and everything that's going on. And, but like you said earlier, they felt guilty almost presenting the product. <laughs> and here's the thing. If you don't believe in the product, you'll be telegraphing that all over the place in your body language, <laughs> in your nonverbal language. And so people can tell, and if you don't believe it, believe me, the customer is going to know there's something wrong with it. Right. And so um, my advice, I guess with super high level advice, if not maybe very tough is that if you don't believe in your product, then you better get out of selling. 
mm. right? Because right. you're going to be telegraphing these signals all, it's unintentional, but you're going to be telegraphing those messages all over the place. But it doesn't have to be like that. The thing is, is what, what's wrong with both those scenarios? And um, it, it, there's a scenario where when we're with a customer and we, we think we only have one shot at it. Right? right, and there's another industry that's even worse than sell, or uh, than cars for that, and that is timeshare. Mm, um, yes. <laughs> and and it's, we, it's a high ticket item, and we're in a, a room, and they think if I don't get it now, I'm never going to get it, and it has bred some of the most unbelievable closing tactics that I've ever seen. I mean, just super dysfunctional, super manipulative. I have a, I have a, almost, if there's a book on closing, I've got it, and. Um, and I've got a whole collection of them that are all around timeshare, and there are some bombs in there that are so, so bad. And I'm not going to name any names, but um, I mean, and the names are all ridiculous. Like, there's one that's like the What Would Jesus Do Atomic Bomb Clothes? That's, oh, if that's the name of the clothes. <laughs> I'm like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? The double reverse clothes. And so here's what's wrong with all of those they're about doing something to the customer. Mm, and yes. so you've got the wrong idea. You've got the wrong idea of what selling is. Selling is about helping them. Do you want them to actually have a nice car? Do you, do you want them to actually have a place where they enjoy? You can go into those exact same selling situations, but be different. And then if you take that scarcity mindset and dump it, get rid of that. You're just serving. Go into each opportunity, tabula rasa, blank slate. Okay. And just, how can I help this person? Mm. Okay. And sometimes as you help that person, the truth is you might recommend a competing product. That's happened to me. Right. Um, but, uh, and I'll tell you a wild story about that if you like, but, um, but so, and sometimes they're going to get you. Here's the thing is if they authentically understand that your intentions are good, then they're going to want to do business with you. Okay. And, uh, doing anything else than that is actually counterproductive. It actually will hurt you. It's so these ideas that you, if I, I'm going to sit you down at a table and then we're going to talk a little bit and then I'm going to go to my mysterious manager in the back room and see if I can get a deal and then come back that whole little game that, um, drives people crazy when they buy cars um, it doesn't have to be like that. It can be very simple. And there's a whole industry. CarMax has totally taken the car industry and flipped it upside down yes. by eliminating that whole part of it. It's really, I mean, I forget what their market share is, but that they, I mean, they've taken what is essentially from a sales perspective, very dysfunctional industry and taken the part everybody dislikes about it out of their entire model. Yeah. Right? And, and I know in a lot of well cities, with they, within two years, they become number one for used car sales. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe they're, they're across the whole country on the average they are. So when, whenever we're looking at this old paradigm of closing, and I know you wrote a book on this, um, I love your seven deadly myths of closing. And I kind of, if you don't mind, I kind of want to go through, because uh, if you could, if we can go through each of them and, and you can be as brief as you want, but myth number one, the sales gambits work. That right there alone, it, I think it shows you what type of, <laughs> and I know you said you had a story on this, but I think timeshare, like you said, that that's perfect in that area. Well, here's the funny thing is that, uh, so when I call them gambits, it's because most of them are manipulative, right? So if, right. You, if you Google and you're not going to Google sales gambits, you're going to Google techniques, but these are the ones that come up and they're all the same ones, right? I mean, the, the, there's probably half a dozen that are the real big ones that you keep seeing over and over and over again. But so Neil Rackham, if you don't know who Neil Rackham is, he um, really is the first guy to ever apply rigorous science to selling. And he did the largest sales study uh, ever done of face-to-face -face sales interactions. It involved over 35,000 face-to-face sales interactions. And, um, and what he found out in all this research that he did is one of the things he tested was um, people's opinion of these, of these techniques. Okay. And what he found out is, is that the people that actually had a positive perspective of the sales tactics that these guys were teaching, they actually performed 21% worse than those people that were skeptical about being able about using those tactics. And so that's the first myth is that they even work. The truth is that they don't work. And, and uh, going further in his, some of his work, they would they'd train these guys on closing techniques. And of course, their activity using those techniques would go up, but in terms of the results that they were actually getting from sales, actually dropped by fifteen percent. So all right? those, so, so uh, all those closing techniques and and everything that they're sitting there training and spending these thousands of dollars on doing, it was actually decreasing. And uh, yeah, because you said it was what twenty one percent below. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, the, the 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 guys that had a positive attitude about these, you know, alternate choice closes and all these different kind of closes. Um, they performed 21% worse 
<laughs> across the uh, across the entire group when they taught them those tactics and then they used them they actually everyone performed 15 percent worse so they don't work right is the is the point of that is is that you know the first thing is why should i learn a closing technique well the truth is as a whole closing techniques don't work so <laughs> so you might want to try something different yeah and, and i think that goes right into you know we've all watched the old school movies boiler room and all that and it goes right into myth two and that's always be closing ABC, always be closing. <laughs> yes, thanks to Alec Baldwin, right, in the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. We, everybody knows the ABCs of sales, right? Always be closing. It's very catchy. It's very memorable. But as it turns out, it is dead wrong. <laughs> and uh, it, this is, again, one of the things that Neil Rackham tested. And he created these things called a high close category. That's where they closed you know, many times during the encounter. And then a, a low close scenario where they closed just slightly over once. And uh, what it turned out is that the high close guys, the guys who were always be closing, they actually perform was actually 33% less effective than the people that just asked one time. Mm. Right. So, uh, and that's even more true when you get to large sales, the bigger the sale um, and maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but what the data shows is that if the decision that's being made turns out to be pretty small, then pressuring the, uh, you know, a client or a customer, can actually bump it a little bit, right? right? It's about 4%, right? You can get a little bit of an increase in, because you're sort of pressuring them to just make a decision or don't make a decision. And that tends to improve if the value is low, it bumps by about 4%. But um, if it's anything north of a certain threshold, it actually becomes counterproductive. And the question is, well, what do you think that threshold is? <laughs> well, the mind blowing thing is it's, a, it's 109 bucks. Okay, so if you sell anything lower than 109 bucks, all right, well, maybe now it's time to whip out the double reverse close, right? <laughs> right, but right. It, almost everybody, actually not almost, every person that I work with sells you know, things more than $109. Right. So that, it's a counterproductive to use those kinds of tactics or, and I'll use, always just be closing and those kinds of things with their kind of sale because it backfires, right, for them. And so we don't want that. We don't want, we want an increase in sales, not a decrease, Right. <laughs> Yeah, so so between and that was what what we just got into is myth three is closing gamuts work on both large and small sales, but what what I really liked about what you had said with this study is by uh, with that rock camp study you said by in your book by forcing the customer into decision closing techniques speed the sales transaction, and then you said closing techniques may increase the chance of making a sale with low price products like you said, but the expensive were were being counterproductive. And I, but who, who sells a product under $109, maybe a door to door salesperson that's, you know, selling Comcast or something, you know, but other than know, that, Comcast over the course of a year is more than 109 bucks. So, yes. uh, you know, I, 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 it's just not very many things like things that you would see at retail might be that. Right. But, um, yeah, almost anything that you would hire a actual sales force to do is going to be higher than 109 bucks. Yeah. And then myth four, you have closing gamut show you want the business. Okay, there's a very famous guy out there. I'm not going to name him, but he's uh, he's. If you've been in sales for any time, you'll have heard his name. And they use this. They justify this. What they say is the customer's happier after you've made a decision, so it's okay to pressure them into making a decision because they're they're going to be happy after that. Okay, so you're helping them. That's the that's what they're saying. That is complete hogwash. It's total justification for their high pressure tactics. And that because the satisfaction that of you know people when they make decisions under pressure, any kind of pressure, but especially sales pressure, is super well studied. And people are very much less happy with their choices when they're made under pressure than when they're not made under pressure. And um, and so I, I think it's just crazy. I mean, uh, when you say um, it shows you want the business, well, come on, the customer knows you want the business. The real right. question is whether or not they see it as you know. Uh, if it damages trust or not. And so there was a, a, a B2B study that um, analyzed, I think it's like half a dozen, there might be seven different closes, you know, the, the uh, impending event close and the uh, alternate choice close and the yes set and all these different closes. And what they did is they um, followed these guys into these meetings and afterwards they talked to the, um, the people they, they met with and they had, a, they filled out a survey and they were testing what the trust level was. And it turns out in literally every single case that, the, that a closing tactic was used, it d diminished trust every time. So there was no close that improved trust. And then the other thing is um, it also showed that the most manipulative techniques 
Um, like I say, uh, you want the green one, don't you? Right. Where, where, mm-hmm. I, where I assume your answer for you. Right. Or I, you know, I say, hey, do you want to buy 200 or 300? Well, what if I don't want to buy either one of those amounts? Right. Or if you want the green one or the blue one, you know, the blue one or the green one. Anyway, um, the most manipulative ones damage trust the most. Right. So uh, it's kind of an uh, ironic that, you know, people are saying out there saying, hey, well, you, sh- you need to show that you want the business and the customer's happier after you've manipulated them. It's just not true. It's just, yeah, the data doesn't show that at all. Yeah. And I think if you're, and, and I, I know this is a lot of people don't think of this when they're thinking in sales, but if you have that helicopter view and you're looking over, if you're damaging trust, the LTV or the lifetime value of that customer for whatever you're, if you're doing repeat business referral or, or you have a subscription model and, and they're purchasing something over and over again, you're actually, I would, I would wonder what that one salesperson in that one sells with that pressure close, how much it's actually costing the company. Bingo. And, um, and so what you're getting at is today, because the, the best strategies involve having a customer for life, right? right? And, and then by purchasing many times over the lifetime of, you know, of doing work or business with them. And so the idea that you're going to take a shortcut and just sell one, but maybe trick them into it, it just doesn't work. Those exact customers actually become super high maintenance afterwards. If you trick them into buying, they're, um, they're, they're hard to work with. They create the most complaints. Right. And so if you want to avoid all of that, I would just recommend you just completely steer clear of that philosophy. Yeah. And I think that leads us right into myth five is customers are happier after making a decision. So using closing yeah. demos is actually like, you know, what you were saying is helping them. But this whole mindset that we think, OK, we pushed them into the now they're going to be happy after they, you know, sign the contract and they're good to go. And here we go. What what are what is the the data out there that you've seen? What what is it saying after that contract sign? Like you said, is it just high maintenance and there's questions afterwards or and, and they cancel right? So you you manipulate them and then you, there are laws in place that allow people a certain window of time to go back on a deal. There's and it, it differs per states, but you know for cars I think it's like three days, but for right. encyclopedias it's like thirty days. And if there are all these things that they you know, are just reactions to bad dysfunctional selling, there's laws out there. So uh, trying to do any of this stuff won't work anyway because the, the customers that are really bamboozled will just cancel on you and then you end up having wasted your time and not got any money either. And then you've got all the maintenance associated with bringing a customer on and then off again, right? And whatever products you might have shipped them or whatever. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, it, it's, it's this thing of all of the ones. There's probably more data on this particular point than any of the other ones because psychologists like to study, uh, like military people, like what choices they make when they're in high pressure situations. And so there's data for almost every possible high pressure scenario where you have to make a decision and how satisfied people are with it. And the short version is that people don't like making decisions when they're under pressure. Some people right. are good at it, but people don't like it. Right. So you're, you're, you're basically setting yourself up if you try to use a tactic that does that. And I think, I think you sum it up with this myth because I wanted to go through the myths and then we're going to get into the new paradigm of, of, of how to close. Cause I think it's important that we address each of these. And what I, what I like that you said here, customers are less satisfied with their decisions made under pressure. And that's not yep. what you want is a, a, a customer that's not satisfied. Right. Right. We want them to, in fact, if there's a secret to selling, it's probably this. Create one really great, happy customer, and then have that customer help you get other customers. Mm. Right? If there's a secret to selling, that's probably it. Just do a great job for one client, have that client help you get other clients. Yeah, that's and it seems so simple. And and I know, especially with uh, on the sell side of things, uh, I was reading a study the other day, and they were talking about um, what the uh, how good are salespeople, you know, in the United States. And they had they had it was like two hundred fifty thousand salespeople or something. It was a crazy amount. I, I read it over again because I wanted to make sure. And they were going over how many of them, they asked them certain questions and were kind of grading them. And they said about, uh, you know, when it comes to being, you know, what the customer felt, where they were trustworthy, you know, were they being transparent with them through the process? You know, how was the negotiation when they did it? They said there was only about 13% of salespeople that, that the customer felt did a good job. Not that they felt right. they, and then they, then they interviewed the salesperson in the process, and the salesperson thought they did an amazing job. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the irony, right? In fact, uh, if you ask any people, almost everybody says, "Oh, I'm better than average at," and you 
put whatever in there, right? But of course, everybody can't be average. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have to be below average, right? And of course, uh, when it comes to salespeople, who have you know tend to have big egos, or in in the worst cases, you've got people that are actually kind of socially obtuse, right? right. They, they don't really they don't really get the vibes that are coming off another person when they're interacting with them. And that can work to some degree, but you got to be really careful about going back to that myth. Number five, if they're, if they're, you know, social intelligence is really low and they're using um, some kind of manipulative technique or some kind of, you know, um, approach that is, you know, socially turning people off. You got to watch out for that. Even though in some cases it, you can get a yes out of a person, it's, it's potentially setting the company up. So, yeah, anyway, it doesn't surprise me all that the salespeople think they do better than the, than they got rated by customers. Yeah, and I think a lot of people use the, uh, and we'll get into this when we get into, um, you know, where you come out with a revolutionary new way in this. But a, a lot of people, if you're using the same clothes as Oregon, you're not looking at the person to serve them and looking at them as individual, looking at them as, as what their exact needs are you know, their needs and wants. You're just looking at them as, let me throw this line out there. Let me do this again. And it's almost, it could be Bill, Jim, Susan, you know, it could be anybody because you're just repeating the same garbage over and over and over again, you know, and, and I think that right there alone is where it creates a dissatisfied customer when they feel like they're not being, you know, we, we've all read the books where Starbucks writes your name on the cup and, you know, we have, you know, customer experiences with personalization and all that. So I think even now the customer is more attuned to this than they probably have ever been. Agreed. And, you know, it, it's really back to that same exact thing we very first talked about, which is, well, what, what, why are you doing this? Right. And if you're in it for yourself, the customer will pick up on that in a New York second. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they, exactly. they will pick up on that. Right. So you just go into it, tabula rasa, figure out, hey, how can I help these guys? How can I really help these guys? You might win, you might not. That's okay. Just go into a blank slate and just do what you can to help the customer. That's how you need to go into every sales situation. Yeah, and, and, and I think this tees right into, and I love that you put myth five there. And you had four or five, and then you had six. And six, six is where I'm seeing a lot of like millennials and younger. They're doing a great job with demonstrating the product, serving the customer. But the, the, a lot of, I think a lot of younger people are falling into myth six. And that is the sale will like, you have the sale will close itself or I've heard words like, well, it'll organically happen. You know, um, can you, can you, I mean, cause this is 180 degrees out from the, uh, you know, using the gambits and doing the close. Can you explain myth six? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, with all this talk about how these closing techniques don't work, you might get the idea or come to the conclusion that you shouldn't make any attempt to close at all. Right. But, uh, and, and then, like you said, there's actually a few people out there that are pushing that mentality, but that is just taking it too far, right? What, what the studies show is that you have to make some kind of an effort, um, or to, in order to close the sale to be successful. Right. And, uh, what Neil Rackham found is that just by asking one question, one question will increase your chances of closing by 36%. Wow. Yeah. And uh, he actually has, a, um, let's see if I can remember the exact quote. What he, what he said is, is that traditional closings, um, they're not the best way to obtain a commitment from a customer. Okay. But doing nothing doesn't work either. Right. <laughs> the, sale does, the sale doesn't close itself. And, uh, and so you are going to have to make some kind of an effort. And, and kind of an interesting fact is that, you know, 50 to 90% of all sales encounters across all industries and without any commitment being asked for whatsoever. That blew my mind right? when it, I read that. That is how much business one, right? is being missed. Hugely. And that's what they're paying us for as salespeople, right? And so 50 to 90, and, and it varies by industry, but 50 is a low number, right? And so to me, that's just mind blowing. If you ask me, hey, why do you think that is? Well, I tell you, it's the same thing that happened to me when I was, when I got drafted into sales is I didn't know how to close and everything that I read, I couldn't see myself doing. I'm yes. like, no, I can't, yes. I can't do that. So mm -hmm. because they can't think of a way of asking for a commitment that isn't manipulative and damage the relationship, they just don't do anything. Right. That's what happened. Yeah. And I've heard so many, I, I was talking to a business owner the other day, successful business. And he's like, I hate sales. You know, I don't even want to hire a salesperson. And he's just getting by with word of mouth. He'll send them a PDF contract, kind of go over the contract with them. But you know, there's almost this, and, and you know, it's like, if you would use proper closing techniques because you have an amazing product, you're an amazing business, you have an amazing culture, you're almost doing a disservice to those that are around you because 
you, they need what you have. And if they get it from exactly. someplace else, it's going to be subpar. Amen. Amen. That is a really great way of describing it is that like, if, if what we do actually helps people, then if we don't do a good job of getting it to them, they're going to do something inferior or they're yes. not going to be able to be able to solve their problem at all. Is that really what we want? That's not helping, right? That's hurting them. So it's, it's on us, right, to do as good as we can and also present it in the best way so that they can make a decision. Right. Right. Not that we're going to try to persuade them one way or the other, but uh, so we can lay out the facts and make it clear to them what the best choice is. And uh, ideally, if we're selling a good quality product, it's going to be us. But there are some maybe some circumstances where that's not the case. And if if that is the case, we would point them in the right direction. Yeah. And you have you have on this myth and I love it. It says the cell will not close itself. You must make an effort to advance or close the cell. Yep. You got to do something. It won't happen by itself. And then you bring up in myth seven, and I think we kind of alluded to this, but I want to get into this a little bit more because here, I think here lies the problem with a lot of it. Myth seven, you have salespeople that fear asking for commitment cannot be helped. And uh-huh. yeah, and, and you have two main reasons why closing efforts fail, and that's a salesperson and professionals don't really make an effort. And when an effort is made, the approach used doesn't work. And it becomes, like we've been saying over and over again, it becomes counterproductive. And then you have all these fears, and I won't read them all, I'll let you go through that, but you have all these different fears that the salesperson's fearing when they're engaging with the customer. Yeah, and that ties back to what we talked about at the beginning. You know, they, they, they don't want to be pushy or they don't want to get humiliated or they're, they're worried they're going to get embarrassed somehow or they're actually so worried they're going to say no that they don't even want to ask. Uh, and, and probably the bigger one is that they're ashamed in some way to be in sales. Right. And so, but, but if you just get to the root of that, um, that, that almost all of that will go away. And let let me, so I, I, am in primarily the, the B2B healthcare space. So mostly high ticket, uh, information systems for hospitals and for clinics and things. Right. Okay. That's what my background has been. And, um, and so we in the hospital or in the healthcare space, we see sales often in a very different way than other people do. And um, uh, you may have heard this a few years ago, but there was this baby named Kaiba Gianfrido. And this kid was born with a tracheal defect. And his parents were literally doing CPR on this kid. After about six weeks, he, was, he would just stop breathing almost every day after oh, he reached wow. about six weeks old. And his parents were doing CPR on him every day. Mm. It happened anywhere. It would happen you know, in a grocery store, in a movie. It happened in a moving car one time. And I mean, can you imagine what that'd be like as a parent? Oh, I mean, do you think they got any sleep at all? You know, afraid that he just might stop breathing, right? And um, and because it was, and they saw a lot of doctors, right? But because it was a birth defect, they just didn't have any answers. And they thought, oh, well, he's just, they're not going to catch it one of these times, right? And he's not going to make it. Well, they eventually got to a, a, a doctor named Dr. Glenn Green out at University of Michigan, C.S. Mott's Children's Hospital. And this guy had invented this amazing biodegradable 3D printed medical splint that might be able to be applied to Kaiba's trachea and maybe save his life. But the the problem was it wasn't approved by the FDA, so he couldn't use it, right? It's just this little thing. You got to see it. It's like the top of a pencil. It's about all the stuff. It's bigger it is, right? And um, and so uh, Dr. Uh, Green went to some extraordinary lengths to try and get the FDA to approve his using this. And fortunately, they approved it, right? And so they did it for the first time, not on an adult like they expected, but on an right. infant. And that procedure was a success. That that biodegradable 3D printed medical splint saved Kaiba's life, right? And so it's a really emotional story. I mean, I mean, you marvel yes. with gratitude at the efforts that this guy went to to save this kid's life. And we all can you know, connect and, uh, with the goodness of it. And we're grateful to call ourselves p- part of humanity when you hear stuff like that. And we say, hey, you know, if I could save a life that way, I would do it, right? Right. Well, here's, here's the thing. Did you know that there was a sale in all that? Yeah, so yeah exactly. This, the CT, the MRI scans that made printing possible cost money. The lasers, 3D printers, the biodegradable materials to print with, all that cost money too. And there's a guy, the guy that actually made that sale, that made all that possible, his name is Scott Hollister. Now, we, we don't hear too much about the selling part of these kinds of things, right? So, um, but let me ask you a question. It, is anybody upset that a sale was made here? Of course not, right? Right, right? Because that sale saved a child's life, right? So the question is, why do we see that kind of a sale different? Why do we see that kind of sale different than other kinds of sales? And the reason is, is we can more easily connect the dots on the positive effects 
that the solution has on people's lives. We can see the benefit, right? We can make that connection. Right. Um, and so that is an example of the kind of experiences or sales that I like to share with folks because those dramatic examples help us to see what selling truly is. It's service. Mm, selling yes. is an act of service, right? His, his going to the work and getting someone to fund all that stuff made it possible for us to save a child's life. And there shouldn't be any hesitation in that, right? In fact, it should be motivating in its own right. And that's the thing is once you realize that what you're doing is you're helping another person, then that all of that baggage that comes with, oh, I'm trying to, you're right. So what you need to do just to cut to the chase here is you need to get off of yourself, get off of what's in it for you and just focus 100% on what you can do to help this customer out. When you do that, your life from a sales perspective will be so much better. And there's actually data out there that shows that you'll be more successful doing it the right way. So it's a win-win, right? Right? Because you and the customer's lives end up getting improved in a virtuous uh, cycle, right? Uh, And so it's 100% noble. It's 100% satisfying when you make it that way. The key is to just get your head your your head in the right place. No, I love that. That's an that's an amazing story. So if if we're a salesperson or business owner and we haven't been working on our closing per se, and we've had this fear uh, of of closing, and I love and you start the book because I kind of want to go through the myths and then get into the book for the second half. And in chapter one, you have, why should I bother to learn the perfect close? And I think you just answered it with the story in the sense of mm-hmm. you're doing a disservice. If you have an amazing product, you believe in it. Um, and like you said, you should only be selling something that you 110% believe in. Then you're, then it's imperative that you learn the perfect close. And get it to as many folks as you can, right? Because how else are we, how, how we going to be able to help? Right? How are we going to scale our ability to serve other people if we don't get good at it? So it's sort of on us to to get better at it. Yeah, I love that. And w- there, because there's one thing, because I, I want to want to kind of park here a little bit, if you don't mind. On chapter three, you talk about, ad- and I think this is where we have to start: is adopting the right mindset. What did you mean by adopting the right mindset? Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, one thing that matters a ton, and I think we've kind of alluded to this a couple times already is that uh, intent is uh, is a factor throughout the entire sale. And and the the reason it matters is because intent actually turns out to matter more than the technique that you Mm. you do, right? Right? So uh, there's a joke out there, right? If you can just fake it, if you can fake intent, then you got it made, right? (laughs) (laughs) Hey guys, Jason here. Want to take a quick break in the podcast to share with you a little bit about our proud partners and what that means for Albuquerque and Albuquerque business specifically. We have different levels in our sponsorship. We have our media partners, and that's 99.9 The Beat. Uh, It's Albuquerque's old school in today's R&B. You hear me talk about that all the time. If you're a business owner, stream 99.9 The Beat. You're going to love it. It's a great, great way to share something that everybody loves, and that's like 80s and 90s hip hop. It's a not-for-profit, minority-owned radio station here local in Albuquerque, helping the art of music. We also, our other media partner is ABQ Live Magazine. If you're at a brewery, if you're anywhere in Albuquerque, look for it. It's ABQ Live, the magazine. You're going to love the articles that are in there, whether it's the five best fish and chips or whatever it is. If you're a foodie, if you want to know what's happening in the nightlife, Uh, If you want to know happy hour specials at all the different bars in Albuquerque, ABQ Live, the magazine, um, is amazing. And there are media partners. We also have Visionary Partners, which is uh, my marketing and consulting company, Rigby Digital. And a Visionary Partner is those that help plan for a new future in Albuquerque. Then we have a program of Trailblazer. And Trailblazer Partners are committed partners helping lead the way for Albuquerque business. And we want to thank Quality Mazda for that. If you're looking for a new vehicle and you haven't seen the premium features that Mazda has, you can get everything that you would think in Mercedes, BMW, Audi. You can get that in a Mazda, but almost half the price, guys. It's amazing. If you haven't looked at a Mazda here lately, I encourage you to go into Quality Mazda on Lomas Boulevard. The staff is amazing. It's not your typical sales. I wouldn't put a car dealership on my website if I didn't think 
that it was the best. So I appreciate Quality Mazda. I appreciate the way that they're transparent on it with customers. And I want to thank you guys um, for supporting these. And then finally, our pioneers. And our pioneers are exploring and finding new ways to chart the course for new business in Albuquerque. And we have a tech company. It's Tartle. So it's T-A-R-T-L-E dot co. Sign up with them. It's free. They want to give you the opportunity to earn money for your data. Facebook, Google, all of them are taking your data for free from you and then using it to exploit back to you advertising. And Tartle.co takes control of that. So you can sign up. It's free. And it's free to earn money. And you get paid for the data that you use online. So I want to thank our visionary trailblazers and pioneer for supporting and championing local business here in Albuquerque. So I'll let you guys go back to the podcast. Thank each and every one of you for listening. And we're back with the Albuquerque Business Podcast. Thank you, sponsors. Appreciate it. We're with James Muir. He is the author of The Perfect Close. And uh, we had took a little break and we were talking about adopting the right mindset, James. Yeah, that's right. The reason that mindset is so critical is that intention is weighed more heavily in selling situations than any of the technique that you learn, right? And so most folks are actually surprised to discover that, to learn that, wait a minute, you mean just the way I want to and to care and serve the customer matters more than my, the, you know, the specific things that come out of my mouth or the things I say? And the answer is yes. Yeah, that's a fact. Because a couple things happen when you first meet a person in the very first few seconds that you meet them. The first thing is we the people try to figure out our intent. What's our intention? Are we good guys or are we bad guys? Right. What are we trying to make happen, right? And then the second thing is they determine what's called a competency. That is, are we able to do what our intentions are, right? And um, and a lot of folks think that if they can just convince the person that they're the best at solving the problem, which is competency, that they're automatically going to get their favor and win the deal. But the truth is, they're focusing way too much on competency, okay? And competency is important. I'm not downplaying that. Right. But uh, in selling situations, people weigh intent more than competence. And here, here's okay. why that is. And, and um, what happens when it comes to selling situations, especially complex sales, there's really no question that the salesperson could potentially take advantage of the buyer, right? Because they know more. And uh, the customer's lack of knowledge about that thing creates risk for them. Right? So there's the capacity or the potential for, for the, the seller to take advantage of them is there, right? And the buyer knows that. And for that reason, what they look for more is intent. They weigh the intention more heavily than they do the actual competency part, right? So, um, for example, you know, I, I, actually, it applies to tons of businesses, right? It doesn't matter. As long as if, it, even if you, they, you are beating your chest and you're very arrogant about how awesome and maybe you are the best at whatever it is that you're saying you are. But if a customer doesn't trust that you're going to serve them, right. the deal's off. In most cases, the deal is off. Okay. And so, um, and here's the irony is that it turns out that we are quietly transmitting all our attentions all the time already unintentionally. <laughs> okay. And there's three, re- there's things, three things behind that three, you know, I don't know, call them psychology or whatever. There's, um, mirror neurons, uh, micro expressions and pair language. And mirror neurons are super fascinating. They were discovered uh, fairly recently in the nineties by a guy named uh, Giacomo Rizzolatti. And, uh, the, the short version is that when we see the actions of another person, we actually feel the same things ourselves. It's really fascinating. Like I, you know, it's, it was a whole accident how they even discovered all this, but there's this invisible level of communication that conveys our emotions to other people. It's why you can sympathize with a character in a movie, right? Now, um, and so that's happening all the time, whether you realize it's happening or not. And then microexpressions are just as interesting. There was a show on TV called Light in Me for um, a couple of years, and uh, it was actually based on a real guy. Uh, and the real guy it was based on is uh, Dr. Paul Ekman. And what he discovered is that there are these brief one fifteenth to one twenty fifth of a second expressions that happen in people's face involuntarily. Oh wow! Okay? And, and um, we can't, you know, you'll see it, and your subconscious will pick up on it. Right. But people can't articulate always. They they will describe it as a feeling or a you know they're getting a vibe or whatever off of a person. But this there's, these micro expressions are an invisible level of communication that actually conveys uh, our intent. Right. And, 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 you know, what our intentions are. So um, there's that. And then the paralanguage and paralanguage. Everybody knows what this is. Right. It's um, 
it's the unspoken communication that comes across, not in the words that you say, but the tonality of your state, right? So if your significant says, I'm fine, you can tell, and you know for sure that they are definitely not fine, <laughs> right? By the way they said it. Oh, yeah. I, I've, so, seen, I've seen it with salespeople, whether they're, you know, having something horrific to happen in their life, you know, going through a divorce or something like that. And then, and then they're, they're, they're coming to you um, saying, you know, I don't know why I'm not selling. You know why? And, and but they're, the way that they're communicating to the customer—that's amazing, though. I, I've never looked at it in that detail because we've always, like, on the sell side of things, we've always kind of looked at it as like, you know, kind of a foo foo way. Like, you know, the universe has energy, and it's you know, it's going in this direction or whatever. But th this is scientifically proven. Definitely so. And I'm not putting down any of the foo foo. There may be something to that, but um, it's definitely scientific that you've got mirror neurons, micro expressions and paralanguage, all that are combining that your autonomic system is doing all the time, whether you want it to or not, that's sending a message to the other guy. And as it turns out, we're really good at picking up on it. Like babies start to pick up on it at 18 months that before they can even speak, they can figure this stuff out. And so, um, it, when, when you tell salespeople, it's like, well, holy smokes, James, how am I supposed to control all that stuff? And the short answer is you can't. You can't. The only thing you can do is get your intention in the right place to start with. If you get your intention in the right place to start with, your body will automatically be sending mm, all the right messages. Yes. And the other person will be picking up on those messages. And then you'll get a fair chance to swing at the plate. It's when you get, if you go into that circumstance, leaning into it, like what's in it for me, it causes your customer to get guarded and they hide their cards. They don't want to tell you right. stuff. They, and then now the, now the sales process becomes super dysfunctional because we got to have useful information from them if we're going to even help them, right? So it's, a, it, it's on us to convey the right intent to them so that they can open up and share the information that, they, that we need in order to make a good diagnosis, right? And prescription without diagnosis is malpractice, mm. right? So we, we got we to gotta listen and honestly know what it is that they're trying to do and their goals and whether or not we can match that before we can ever help guide them into whatever decision they're trying to make. And when we go into it leaning about, I want to get this person's money, you're sending all the wrong signals and that causes them to pull way back. And yeah, so our, they, and. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. So, no. But you, so you have this ego selfishness coming, that intent, or you have the other intent, which I want you to speak on, which I think a lot of, I would say probably 60 to 70% of salespeople, their, the intent is coming out of fear. Yeah, absolutely. Or scarcity, right? Right. And, yes. and, and, and you know what? The whole way the sales industry works kind of, it's not going to change, but it, it kind of pushes on that because they've got quota. Right. Mm, they got right. quota. Hey, you, you better, you know, and if you don't attain quota one, you're not going to get any money. How are you going to feed your family? And then, and then second, you know, maybe you're not going to be here next year. Right. So those are things that are, are real reasons why um, people go into these, like salespeople go into these situations dysfunctionally conveying all the wrong messages, but there are things you can do. Right. And the first thing is just get your head around, Hey, selling is serving. So you don't have, don't worry about what's in it for you. As long as you take care of the other person. Yeah. In fact, Zig Ziglar is famous for saying you can get everything in this life that you want. If you can help enough other people get what they want. Oh, that's so good. Okay. Yes. And if you, and so if you believe that and you operate at that level, you can just go in and think, see how you can help someone and you'll get everything that you need. Trust me. The most successful salespeople have already made this, have turned this corner. And, and you find any successful salesperson and they'll, they'll tell, tell you the, the day that the light bulb turned on for them where they didn't have to lean into it so hard. They could just like, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and see if I can help these guys. And then ironically, that is more effective than everything else. And so it's, it's more fun, right? You can go into it without any stress. You just, you're actually helping a person and then it turns out to be far more successful. And so it's like the sweet spot of selling. Everybody wins. Yeah, that's so good. And and I think going into the salesperson in chapter four, you talk about planning equals success. And one of the things that you talk about is the importance of clarity. What what like planning equals success. So like planning and clarity, how do like how would I look at that as a salesperson on chapter four? What were you what were you trying to, you know, get that message out there to to somebody that's on the ground? Well, starting at chapter four and then leading all the way up to chapter twelve where we have the where the perfect close is revealed. Um, well, really what we're trying to do is at, it, with, with the perfect close, you're going to need to know what you want the customer to do. Okay. And so you need to have a little bit of clarity about when you meet with somebody, right. For a salesperson, well, what do you want to happen? <laughs> and <laughs> you'd be surprised, right? Uh, I mean, when you ask that question to salespeople, what well, the majority of them will say, I'm trying to close the sale. Right. But here's what the data shows. 
nine out of 10 encounters don't end with either a win or a lose. That's not what actually happens. In nine out of 10 sales encounters, what, get, what happens is we either get what's called an advance, which is moving the sale forward in a little way, right. or we get what's called a continuation, which is the sale is going to continue, but really no progress was just made, right? And so it's languishing. And um, so the reason we want to get clarity about what we want to happen in our meeting is so that when it comes time to use the perfect close, we'll know how to ask for it. That's all that, I mean, it's, it's really no more complicated than that. And so I give us some criteria, you know, about what um, an advance is and what, you know, because people get confused, right? They think, oh, I just presented something. Is that an advance? Well, it's not. An advance is when the customer does something. Yes. Right? They make a decision. They take an action, right? And, and then the action needs to require a little bit of effort and energy on their part. That tells us that, the, that it's real, right? So, um, I mean, uh, rather than go through all those chapters, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what's, what's the ideal advance, what's the best thing that could happen in this meeting. And then we want to have a couple of backup, um, backup things, just in case the thing we think is ideal isn't realistic for the customer for whatever reason, right? So we're going to have an ideal advance and a couple backups. And if you've got that prepared, then you're ready to execute the perfect close. And if you want, I mean, we can just tell your audience what the, what the questions are. <laughs> yes, I know you have that in the book too, to skip to right to chapter 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think we're, we're right here on the advances and it's so simple, right? So you, you want to have clarity about what you want to have happen, A, with the deal as right. a whole, but also on this meeting. What do you want to happen in this exact meeting? And uh, if you do that, then it's really easy to move the process forward with no pressure and a super high probability of success. And uh, it takes two questions, but sometimes you only need one question. And, and the first of those two questions is just, does it make sense to X? Okay, mm. where X is going to be your ideal advance, right? So right. let's just say we were consultants. Does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment to see what our best options are? Okay, in that case, in that sentence, the, the assessment is the X, right? And there's really only two things they can say. They're going to say yes, or they're going to say no. If they say yes, awesome, you, right? You just got your advance, uh, and you only had to use one of the two questions. Okay, if they say no, and by the way, when you when you share this with salespeople, that's what they're worried about. Like, well, what if they say no? Okay. Then uh, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but you also don't need to get hung up if they say no, okay? Because they haven't really said no, they won't do your thing, right? Okay, because it's re it's really a timing question. But um, if they say no, then the very the, the most simple version, right? The kindergarten version is just throw the ball back to them and say, okay, well, what do you think is a good next step then? <laughs> and I have been on almost a thousand ride-alongs now, okay. And what I can tell you is that in 90% of cases, the client is going to suggest a very logical advance for what for you know that's appropriate for them where they're at in their buying process right now, okay? And customers always act on their own suggestions. <laughs> so it's great. You say, you know, does it make sense for us to ask? If they say yes, great, you get it. If no, you throw the ball back to them. Well, what do you think is a good next step then? And then 90% of the time, they'll come back with whatever the right thing to do is, okay? And uh, what's important about this process here is that what we're doing is we're pacing the sale at exactly the rate that the client's ready for. And there's a couple ways you can slow it down and speed it up, okay? There's something called a suggestion, which is we would say, um, you know, other clients at this stage tend to do X. Mm. Does it make sense for us to do X? Okay, so we're suggesting. And that's a lot more important when the thing that you sell is something that a person doesn't buy very often. Okay, like once in a lifetime. Okay, uh, so uh, when you're suggesting a logical next step, you're helping them. You're helping it sort of show the way of how other people do it. Right. Okay, again, it, the answer is going to be the same. Um, they can, you're going to say yes or they're going to say no. If they say no, you can always fall back to your other. You can suggest one of the alternates that you had planned. You could say, okay, well, you know, sometimes clients at this stage will do this other thing. Does it make sense for us to do that? Okay, and again, either yes or no. Um, if they say yes, awesome. You just got your advances. If they say no, you can either fall back to another one or you can just throw the ball back to them. Say, well, what do you think is the next step then? Okay, so what that does, oh, let's talk about the add-on and then we'll talk about pacing again. Okay, so the add-on is the flip of that. Let's just say, you know, we say, hey, does it make sense for us to schedule an assessment? And they say, yeah, great. And go, oh, well, good. We well, you know sometimes clients at this stage will also do this other thing. Do you want to do that too? Right? If they say yes, then you can do another one. Right. They can say, oh, you know, sometimes. And in fact, um, I had this crazy experience where uh, we, we were working for this clinic in um, Sierra Vista, Arizona. We thought we were presenting to the wrong people. It was an IT guy and his team. And when we're all done, you know, I, I said, well, hey, um, does it make sense for us to schedule a demo for the executive team? Because that's who I thought was really going to make the decision, right? right? And, and he goes, oh, yeah, we, we definitely need to get their, them on board. I'm like, awesome, cha-ching, right? I got my event. So I look at my list. My second thing, I said, well, you know, sometimes clients at this stage will, will have us have our technical people meet 
so that we can talk through the conversion and the details around that. Does it make sense for us to schedule time for our tech people to talk? He goes, yes, my guys are really worried about that. I'm like, wow, cha-ching, two for two, right? right? So I said, well, you know, I think we got everything we need to put together a preliminary proposal for you guys. Do you want me to put together some numbers so you can get an idea of the scope of the project? He goes, oh, I would love that. I'm like, wow, cha-ching, three for three. I didn't even think I was talking to the right guy and I got three things, right? right. And so I just, at the end, uh, uh, in the fallback, what you do is you, you throw down the ball and you say, what's a good next step? On the add-on, what you do is you say, are there any other logical steps we should be thinking about? And I asked this guy that. I said, well, is there anything else we should be thinking about? And he, you won't even believe what this guy says. He says, he kind of lowers his voice so that nobody hears. And he goes, well, is there any chance I can get a copy of your agreement? Because our legal people can be kind of slow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 and, right then and you I, know. I, I, oh, well, of course, on the outside, I'm going like, well, yes, of course, I'd be happy to get the copy <laughs> of it. Uh, you know, but on the inside, I'm going, yeah, baby, are you kidding me? Of course, I can get you a contract, right? And, and so the whole point of all of that, right, is just that we can, uh, we can pace what we're doing to, mat, to throttle it to what they're ready for. In this case, this guy was really ready. He was way, way more. Yes, I mean, I got yeah. four advances out of there, and I didn't even plan the last one, right? And um, so we can either throttle it back or we can move it forward. But the whole point is it's when we try to push a customer faster than they're ready for. That's when it starts to feel like manipulation to them. And this lets us just throttle it exactly to where they want to be. And I, I love, and, and maybe you could talk about this real quick. I love how you... Talk about the difference between an advance and a close. Yeah, so a close is at the very end, right? When we right. finally get an agreement and a contract and, you know, we've got the order, it's closed. But an advance is moving the, like, there's a technical definition, but the, the easy definition is just moving the sale forward in a little way. And the funny thing is that Neil Rackham discovered that nine out of 10 sales meetings don't end with a win or a lose. That's not what actually happens. What actually happens is the sale moves forward in a little way, that is we get an advance, or another scenario where really not, nothing, no progress is made at all. And he called that a continuation. I mean, the deal's not dead, but it, it's, it's continuation. And it's important for people to, when they're make, getting clarity, like where you originally started with this question, is when, to get clarity about what you want to happen, well, make sure that that's actually an advance. Right. And not a, not a, like, and so the thing that will happen is, you know, it's uh, for some salespeople, they like to talk, right? And so they, they, if they give a big presentation and they talked a lot, well, they feel really good about it. And so they would probably tell you that they made some progress on that. But that's not the definition of what an advance is. An advance is a action either in the meeting or right afterwards that requires action and energy on behalf of the client. I love okay? that. Yeah, that's so so it, it has to have those two things. It has to have action. They have to, they have to do something. And it has to take a little bit of effort, okay? And so you giving a presentation, even if it was for 90 minutes and it was glorious to you, it doesn't count because the customer didn't do anything. Right. Maybe sit there and listen to it, right? And so um, one of the things you do in, in the book, it's got a little, like a little workshop in chapter eight where you can figure out what are all the little advances that are part of my sale? What, what, what are all the little yeses on the way to the big yes? And by defining what those are for your sale, it's really easy to plan. You just go look at your list and say, okay, well, what do I want to happen? Well, I hope that this happens. That's my ideal thing. And these are my two backups. Right. And then you go in there, you be 100% present with the customer. And then when it, and my advice is to create an agenda. And right on the agenda, it, you put action items, next steps. And that's the very moment that you're going to ask your perfect closed question. Now it doesn't seem awkward. You don't have to predict the timing of it. You're just going to go through your agenda and at that point say, all right, well, does it make sense for us to? And when it, whatever you plan is your ideal advance. It's supernatural. Yeah, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of salespeople, you can you can do this. I mean, you could do this right up front. I had I had went somewhere and someone asked me right off the bat, they said, well, how much time do you have? They asked me that question. They said, okay, in this amount of time, we can accomplish this, this, and this. You know, and then they use the, does that sound fair to you? But, you know, but it, it, it kind of outlined those 45 minutes that I had and said, can we do this, this, and this? And then I came to agreement on that. And it just made everything go so smoothly um, in that process. Boom. And that gets right back to what we were saying before, is that intent matters more than technique. So here's the thing. We've just given you a technique, right? Anybody who just listened to this, your show, can, doesn't even have to get the book now because they just learned the perfect close questions, right? So <laughs> No, everybody so, get the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Or download the, the free report and, that'll, uh, and the first three chapters, and that'll tell you whether it's something you want. But anyway, where I'm going with this is that 
So you just gave a very similar variation of the same thing that was in the book. It totally works. It totally works. You can customize this to match your personal style right. because if you, if your intention's in the right place, you could actually butcher the technique and it will still, and it will still work if the customer tells you you're actually trying to help. But on the other, on the flip side, imagine this, imagine that they clearly can tell that you're doing something self-serving and you, then you use the technique perfectly as described in the book. I guarantee you it still won't work. <laughs> and that's because your intent matters more than your technique. Right. Does. Right. Exactly. And, and you have something in, in, um, cause you mentioned chapter eight, chapter nine was how can I provide value on this encounter? I know that's the mm. serving part. And I think a lot of people misconstrue value. Value, like you said, I talked for 90 minutes and gave the best presentation I've ever given in my life. What is value? What is, how does the customer perceive value and how do you display that to the customer? Wow. Well, that's actually changed quite a bit uh, over the last few years. So customers really, rather than just want the best price or a good warranty or delivery on time, they want, they want beyond that now. So their expectation of what's value, but just to simplify, right, that we could do a whole hour on just how to add value to each meeting, um, is that customer uh, value is what the customer says it is, not what you right. say it is, okay? And what the um, there's three magic questions that you should be answering before you go into any sales meeting, and those are um, what you know what do, why should this customer meet with me? That's the number one question. Um, the second one is um, what do I want the customer to do, okay? And how can I add value on this encounter? Those three things, okay? The first one is why should the customer meet with me? That gets to the core of your value proposition. You should know what your value proposition is, right? Or you're wasting your customer's time. Right. So um, the second is what we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes or so, which is what do I want the customer to do? And then the last is how do I add value to this meeting? And that's kind of important because as it turns out, um, uh, there's some, uh, a study done by HealthWeight that showed that when the seller identified an unanticipated solution, an unrecognized problem or some unseen opportunity. In those three scenarios, the customer was actually willing to pay a premium for the solution. Now, the common denominator across those three is that they're all unexpected. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to put a surprise value moment in the meeting to make mm-hmm. the meeting itself inherently valuable. Right. Okay. And so I call it unexpected value, but I didn't invent this idea. This is just um, just telling you what the data shows. But it, if you want to make your meeting inherently valuable, what you're trying to do is bring some value to the table that they're not really expecting, but you deliver it when you get there. And there's about seven different ways you can do that. I mean, there's, and I, we go through some length uh, in the book about how to create value on your encounter. Um, but if you can decide how you're going to add value and then do it as, I mean, we don't want to, the truth is it needs to be unexpected. So right. it, 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 it should be a pleasant surprise. We'll say it that way. Okay. But if you do that, you're literally adding value to your, your solution. Like the customers won't ask for discounts. They'll value your solution more than another one so that you can get a premium for it. And so that's all about adding value. But um, adding the value, it doesn't have anything to do with the product. It just has to do with the selling process. And so if you, if you answer those three questions and make sure that what you, when you go into every meeting that you're giving some sort of insight, or that, which is the number one way to add value, by the way, is just to add Create, create some unanticipated, you know, discovery that you can share with them. They're like, wow, I learned a thing today. That's a very inexpensive way for you to add value. You can do it by asking questions. You can do it by understanding their needs. You can help them see how they can get to where they're trying to go. If it's unclear to them, you can share some new ideas. You can deliver education and you can share news and things like that. All of those things are ways to make your meeting more valuable. And there's essentially an infinite, you know, using those seven, there's probably an infinite number of ways you could add value. Yeah, and, and but if you do, go ahead, Frank. Oh no, no, that's fine. Uh, I got a uh, a package the other day. I ordered something online. I think we're all tending to order everything online now with the situation at hand. But they no had doubt. a it was a surprise value. They had a little token in there, and it had a tree on it, like a little coin, and then it had a postcard in there. And so the coin was free from what I ordered. It was different from what I actually ordered. Any not even close to what I ordered. And I had a little postcard in there, and it shared, you know, that they their company wants to plant trees. They want to work with the, um, you know, the arbor or whatever trees and, and sure. plant trees. But that little coin was cool. I actually have it next to my computer. It's sitting there. Um, and I read the postcard both sides, you know, before I threw it away. But it was just kind of this whole idea that, you know, I was expecting the product. The product was presented amazingly in a box, looked like a little, you know, like how Apple does with their iPhones. But to get that little coin and to have that, it it, it kind of justified my purchase, I guess you would say. 
Absolutely. So it's, that is an example of adding value where we can't do it face to face. Right. And so they've, they've done it and they've surprised you with something extra in the package. Right. Right. And, um, and so it's a perfect example of the same principle is it made you feel like what you got was even more valuable than what you paid for. Right. Right. And you can do that with your own meetings. It's kind of important in sales to do it in your meetings because what happens is the customer is actually sampling their experience with you. Every time they meet with you, they say, hmm, this is probably what it's like to work with, with, the, with the company mm, for the next, right, right. You know, next years or whatever. And so they're taking a thin slice of what their experience is with you and they're projecting what their whole experience will be based off that. So you want each sample of our experience with them to be very, very good because they extrapolate that. And um, that principle can either work for you or against you. I can't even tell you the number of times I've had a salesperson tell me, I lost this deal to a system that wasn't even half as good as our solution. Mm. Not even half. How did that happen? And the reason that can happen is what they're being outsold is what's happening is the customer's slice of experience with the, the salesperson they were working with was better than the other guys, right? Even though his product was technically superior, right? And, uh, and that's why you don't want to rely hundred percent on competence. Like we talked about before to try to win your, you know, beat your chest. I'm the best. Because customers who are going to look at uh, your intent and their experience with you, and they're going to project what that's going to be like. So um, what, one of the things you can do to make sure that your experience is really great is just think a little bit before you go. And say, hey, what can I do to add some unexpected value to this visit? And it, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be a, a – you could give them something, I guess. But um, usually what they prefer the most and what's best for you is some kind of insight and or that demonstrates your expertise, but it's inherent. I mean, it's truly valuable to them. That doesn't cost anybody anything in that scenario, but makes the, the visit more valuable. And so that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a good, that's where I would tell people to start to try to find, you know, something good that they can share in the experience because it, it, it's a way to add value that doesn't cost anything. I love that. And you, and so we've, we've got into, we've had the meeting, we've got into the advances, we've added a surprise value. Um, now we're looking at the perfect close. And um, I know I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I want to get into this perfect close and then um, we'll get into your website and all that and where people can purchase your book. But the perfect close. So now we're at that moment where we're, it's time to close. What is the perfect close? Okay. Well, um, there's actually five different variations of the perfect close. But the most basic of those five is just two questions. And that first question is, does it make sense to X? And uh, if, you know, if they say no to that, then you throw the ball back to them and say, okay, what do you think is a good next step? Okay, that's the kindergarten version. Now, the next, the next variation is called the suggestion, where we say other people at this stage do X. It doesn't make sense for us to do X. And then in their reply, if they say no, there's another variation called the fallback. And that's just where we would make a suggestion of one of the other alternate advances that we had planned for them, right? And, uh, and so that's called the fallback. And then... The, uh, the fourth variation is called the add-on, and that is you know, if they say yes to one of our choice, you know, one of our suggestions, then we can just add another one on, and we can keep, and in theory, you could add on infinitely, right? Usually, you're only preparing three or so, um, and then at the end of that, uh, instead of saying, what do you think is a good next step, we just ask them, you know, what's, what's, you know, are there any other things we should be considering right now? And that gives them a chance to take it in any direction that they might want to do, and like I said, in the example I shared customer asking for a contract, which I would have never dreamed. Of, right. right? I, yeah. In fact, I'll bet if I walked in the day, right, right at the beginning and said, Hey, you know, just make sense for me to get your contract. I think he would have, you know, I think he would have been turned off by that, but by pacing it exactly the way he was ready for, we got four advances, one of which we didn't even think of. Right. So the last variation is uh, called something special. Mm. And um, so uh, the something special variation is um, especially popular with managers and publicly traded companies, people who are, got some kind of deadline to get a deal done. And so a really common thing is people would try to discount something in order to uh, get a deal done, right? And um, maybe I should tell you how this came about because uh, when I was brand new to sales, I had this whiteboard in my office and I was, this, was, I was, this was my first time working for a publicly traded company, okay? So this is like 30 years ago. And, um, and so uh, I had all my opportunities on this board and I'd only been there for about a month and a half and they called us and they said, that, when I say they, I mean executive management, called us and said, we're having a tough quarter, right? So, I, they, and they told me, I want you to offer discounts to all, I had 10 deals on there. One of them, by the way, was ready to go already. And the other nine were somewhere in the middle of their process. 
So they said, oh, we want you to ask, offer discounts to all 10 of them to try to get them to close by the end of the quarter because we're having a tough quarter. So, hey, okay, being a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed new guy, I did exactly what they said, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'll say, how do you think it turned out, by the way? Do you want to uh, know? I would say <laughs> if you discounted it and you were new, um, probably, what was it, 50-50 sales, probably? I wish, and that's probably what they thought would happen. But what actually happened is only one deal closed. Mm. And you know what? Which one do you think that was? The one that was already very close to closing, anyway. Right. The other, the other nine, they didn't say they didn't say we're not going to buy your stuff. They just did, decided to continue their process rather than take advantage of the discounts. Okay. And so then, in the next quarter, um, I had to meet with all those people, and everybody when I offered the discounts, every one of them knew that it was contingent on them purchasing before the end of the quarter, and they wouldn't, get, they were not going to get that discount if they go purchase later. Okay. But with every single one of those nine, I had to have this awkward conversation with right. them about whether yes. or not they were going to see that you get the same discount they saw the, the previous quarter, right? And if I would resist, you could literally see the tangible erosion of goodwill on their faces. And, and so fortunately, and near the end of the very next quarter, I had the same Chinese fire drill where the corporate called us on the phone <laughs> and said, hey, you need to offer discounts. And so they used to call it weapons free. You're now weapons free, right? You can, you can offer discounts. So I just fortunately used that as the chance to give them all the discounts that they saw before and everything ended well. I actually closed it a total of eight out of those 10, which is awesome. But it got me thinking about this and like, I'm like, man, there, I mean, cause all the deals came in, but they were all lower margin right? because we had to give them the discount that they had seen the previous quarter. And if they had never seen that, we wouldn't have had to offer it. I wouldn't have to give it to them. Right. So I thought there's got to be a way to see if a customer can really close by the end of the quarter without telegraphing what the discount is or what the concession is going to be. So I don't have to give it to them even if the timing's not right. And that's actually how um, how uh, something special was born. Okay, and uh, basically what um, what something special does is it reveals whether a customer is ready to close on your time frame um, without uh, telegraphing what your concession is. Okay. And so my advice is, if you're listening, is to do it exactly the way I'm telling you, okay? Because I have trained lots of people, and if, and if, you, if you get it wrong, um, you'll end up giving a discount, okay? So here's how it goes. The, the, the something special variation sounds exactly like this. Does it make sense for me to see if we can do something special for you, if we can get everything wrapped up by the end of the quarter? Mm. Now, obviously, you're going to change the time frame to match whatever right. you're doing, right? But otherwise, that, you know, besides changing that part, I would just say use it verbatim. And... So let me, let me just say it again. Does it make sense for me to see if we can do something special for you if we can get everything wrapped up by the end of the quarter? Okay. So we're not telling them what something special is. In fact, right. they might ask that. Okay. Right. And I said, well, what's the something special? And, and, and then you would say, you know, the mindset you want to have is you don't want to have a concession ready. You need to say, play dumb and go, well, I don't know without talking to some people, but if you right. think the timing's right, I'll go ask. Right. Right. And so if they say yes, then boom, you now, you know, this can happen inside the, the quarter or the month or whatever you're trying to do. If they say stuff like, no, no, our, our CEO's out until the holidays is over. Hey, good to know, right? If you'd offered them a big discount, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. You'd just be giving them that discount in January after the holidays are over. So um, that's the important thing that this does is it, it protects your margins going into the next period and determines whether or not they can actually uh, close or not. Oh, that's and, and so good. Time, you're, yeah, and, you, and you're just positioning yourself as a as a resource, right? Right. You're, you're you're an advocate for them. You're just trying to see if there's something special you can do for them. So it's all positive, hundred percent positive. Because you got to think, uh, James, how many cells are closed by discounting? I mean, oh I would probably eighty percent. So, so, and it's really kind of a weak tactic, right? If you actually do your discovery process and you can create, you can monetize the thing that you're doing. If you, if you explain the value that you're giving, the reason people discount so much is because they're not very good at describing what the value that their solution actually brings. Mm, that's so and if good. you can do, if you can do that, then, um, you'll be able to, and, and I can tell your audience real quick here, there's a very five, five golden questions you can use to figure out the value on the back of an envelope while you're with a customer. Okay. So you figure out what is the thing that they're trying to change? Okay. And say, so, and what you would just say, how do you, how do you know whether you're doing good or not? in this area and they'll give you a metric, right? So we'll say it's accounts receivable or days or denial rate or whatever it is. Okay. You're going to give you a metric and you say, well, what's the value of that now? What do you want it to be? What's the value of the difference? Okay. Now you've got a number. Right. And then what's, what's the value over time? Mm. Okay. Like five, like five years. 
and on the back of the envelope, it doesn't even have to be precise. They'll be able to see the value that you're bringing them. And then, and then you'll, you'll say, Hey, well, this seems like it's like, you know, this looks like it's 150 grand. Is, is that right? And they go, if anything, it's, that's lower. It's higher than that. And I can't even tell you the number of times that that happens. And so now we've established kind of what the value is. We can, and usually you've had a conversation before you can get to that stage, right, but right. that they know the size of their problem is worth in that case, $150,000. So anything less than 150 is going to be a great deal to them. Right. And it's when we don't give them any reference point for value. That's when they, that's oh, when they I love like, that well, because gosh, you're this putting looks, this time looks like an expense, right? Yes. Yes. You're putting time out there. You're saying, okay, five years, this is how much it's going to cost you. And then you're also giving trust and you're giving that lifetime value with the customer. I mean, that's, I mean, this, this is the perfect close because you're, you're at that moment where you're showing them by not making a decision right now, this is where you're actually at. Logically. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, now it's not in the book. So let's tell your audience again what it is. So the first question is, how do you measure it? What's the value of it? What, what do you want it to be? What's the, what's the value of the difference? And what's that over time? Mm, Those are the five questions. I love that. Well, I'm going to, uh, what is, cause I, I've spent an hour over your time, James, and I know that's valuable. <laughs> what is your website that people can go to? So it's puremuir.com. We were joking about that before we jumped on. So, so people <laughs> can I pronounce my last name. Yeah, it's, it's P-U-R-E, so like the word pure, muir, M-U-I-R.com. And so you, if you go there, there is a, there's a resources page. And in that resources page, there's like 14 different resources you can download, like including the special, you know, the, the seven deadly sins of, um, of uh, closing, which is a myth we just talked about at the right. beginning. Uh, it's got first three chapters of the book so you can know that for sure that it's for you. And then it's got all the models we talked about drawn out for you. Uh, it's got a mind map and I mean, there's, there's uh, agenda forms, planning forms, all that kind of stuff there. And it's all free, all free. The whole point is just to make sure that the book is what you want. And then, uh, and then if, if you like it, great, go to Amazon and you can pick it up. Yeah. I think, I think the resources that you gave, I mean, the mind map alone, the perfect close mind map, that alone is worth thousands of dollars. And so to be able to purchase the book, I know it's not, um, you've reasonably priced it and you've given out so much value to everyone. Um, I know I, when I went through everything, it, 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 all these light bulbs kept clicking and I, and I hope that with these small business owners, entrepreneurs, sales managers, directors that are out there listening to this, if you implement this one, what I love about this is it's right. It's it's the right way to treat your customers. Mm-hmm. Two, you're teaching, you're developing a culture of serving, um, which is going to transform your business, you know, in and of itself. And three, you're putting, you're not being selfish and egotistical, which is what everybody thinks when they come into contact with the salesperson is you're showing enough humility to listen, and then from there guiding them along, like you said, guiding them along to get to the point to where they understand that this is not just a ton of value, but that it is the ability for them to proceed. And and I, I, I love this. I, I That's why I reached out to you. I thank you for being on the podcast. I want to ask you, you're in Utah, right? Yes. I'm originally from Idaho, actually, but I moved to Salt Lake City and I live in the mountains just south of Salt Lake City. Is Utah pretty safe? With the I know we're going through the COVID-19 right now. How is how, yeah. how are you guys doing? We're in the bottom five states uh, in terms of uh, both infections and, and fatalities. So um, we're doing we're doing pretty good. I, they might open. We might be one of the first states that opens up. Oh, that's awesome. I'm in New Mexico. So they're, they're talking about opening up around the 15th. They built a, a council of oh, you top might beat business us, leaders. But, yeah. Yeah, they're talking about the end of May, maybe for us. So you might beat me by a couple of weeks. So how has um so has uh have have you guys seen a sales loss? Have you have you grown in sales, or how has it been? You know, um, we've done great actually, but we were doing a ton of stuff remotely already. So this didn't really change. It just meant the on-site stuff that we do, uh, we were not able to do. Uh, so any kind of events that we were attending and things like that had to get bumped, but we're already doing tons of stuff uh, via remote. So that didn't really change anything. And I have clients that are crushing it right now that are having record weeks every single week. So certainly some industries, you know, drop dips. I, I don't uh, deny that, but I, there are, there are some of my clients that are having the best quarters and um, weeks that they've ever had. And that's because they're in the shipping industry and they're, you know, so they can't hardly keep up with the demand. 
uh, because we're all buying stuff through the mail now, right? <laughs> yes. so, <laughs> yeah, everything's changed. It's amazing. Well, James, I want to thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the podcast. I encourage everybody, go to Amazon. Um, you can you can get it on Kindle. You can buy the book. It's called The Perfect Closer. Do both. That would be awesome when you'd have it on your phone all the time or on your Kindle and the other, you, you could have it in your library. But I encourage everybody to do that. They can also go to www.pure muir.com. And once again, thank you, James, for sharing this information and, and, and giving us so many gold um, ideas that are out there that can help us. Thanks for having me on, Jason. It was great. Okay. You have a, you ha- I hope you and your family stay safe. Have an amazing day. Right back at you. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque Business Podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share. And go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.